Time is 1.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. We no longer have access to the places of our ancestors. It disconnects us from who we were before. Even our identity is corrupted. The notion that doing live fire training at Makua would not have the potential to have significant effects on the human environment just didn't pass the straight face test. Makua Valley, on the island of Oahu, is where native Hawaiians lived for more than a thousand years. That is until the U.S. military evicted the natives so they could use the area for training with live ammunition and weapons. Native Hawaiian and Making Contact intern Samson Rainey reports on what happens when the military takes over historically sacred land and how people are fighting back to reclaim this once pristine area. On this edition, we're offered a glimpse into a paradise lost. I'm Tina Rubio, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. It's a humid yet breezy day in Makua Valley on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. English teacher and anti-military activist Summer Nemeth and I just completed a five-mile hike around the impressive valley. Tired and flushed, we take a break on its shores. Summer's ancestors lived in Makua for many generations. Every time I come into the valley, I, I can't help but um, feel like I've been harmed personally. and. It's hard for me to hold it together sometimes. I walk into the valley and sometimes the tears just flow and I think, you know, I hope that someday it's going to be different, that I'm not going to have to see the place where my ancestors live, the land that provided for them behind barbed wire. Beneath the facade of its unspoiled beaches and lush green valleys, Hawaii hides an unsettling history. There are thousands of acres of military bases and reservations here. In World War II, the military wrested away 4,200 acres of Makua Valley for military training, displacing hundreds of Hawaiians in the process. And so I feel for everybody that was in the valley that lost, that lost its, um, lost being able to be a part of the, to hear the wind and to feel the sun on your back to hear the water flowing. Um, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back to time and just see, see how it was. In the last several years, there has been strong opposition to the continued military presence in the valley. That's because the military has decimated thousands of acres of land and destroyed culturally indigenous sites. David Henkin is an attorney for Earth Justice, a nonprofit environmental law firm. He's been waging a nine-year legal battle over the military's right to train in Makua. Folks there for literally decades had been asking the Army for information about what the impacts were of live fire training at Makua. Military live fire training uses real ammunition, ranging from assault rifles to missile systems, in a simulated battle environment. There are literally dozens and dozens of ancient Hawaiian sites, ahus and heiaus, shrines and temples. There are over 40 federally listed threatened and endangered species in Makua Valley. They're wondering about the impacts on the marine resources, the fish and the edible algae, uh, the limu, uh, that people gather and, and eat for subsistence and put on their table. They're wondering about the impacts on their children who would play in the beaches at Makua from the training that would happen just across the road in, in Makua Valley. Folks in the valley say live fire training pollutes the ground and drinking water and sends toxic particles into the air. And there's something called unexploded ordnance. That's ammunition that's been fired but doesn't detonate when launched. Yet it can still explode decades later. And Hankin says, besides the fallout from fired ammunition, there's another major concern. Chemical contamination. One thing to keep in mind when you talk about chemical contamination is that while the Army wants to put a very narrow focus only on the weapons that are fired at Makua, the extent of military activities at Makua is much greater. So first you need to look at all of the heavy metals and other chemical compounds that make up the different weapon systems that are fired there, uh, not only lead, but cadmium, a um, variety of other heavy metals that wash down into the streams, then from the streams down into the ocean. 
In addition, in order to do live fire training at Makua, in order to try and minimize the number of catastrophic wildfires, they do vegetation management, which involves the use of pesticides, the use of herbicides, the use of gasoline-powered weed-whacking tools. They use automobiles. They use trucks that are leaky. In the late 1990s, the Army did test the streams flowing out of Makua. The results were alarming. Forty different chemicals like lead, cadmium, and furons were found in the water. The potential health hazards of these substances seem worthy of a more intensive study. Many people subsist on the marine life found in these waters. I should know, I was one of them. But the Army doesn't seem to think people live off the land and water. That's simply wrong. There's a very high level of consumption of fish, of seaweed, of other resources from the sea. Uh, and for those people in economically depressed areas, like many along the Waianae coast, that is not a weekend treat to go out and get fish from the sea. That is your supermarket. That is where you need to go to put food on the table. And you have an absolute right to know if it's safe. In 1998, Earth Justice brought the first in a series of lawsuits on behalf of Malama Makua. A group of cultural practitioners, Hawaiian rights activists, and environmentalists advocating the return of the valley to the community. The firm argued the Army violated the National Environmental Policy Act. That means it did not conduct any studies to assess whether or not the training in the valley would have any environmental impacts. That resulted in a settlement in 1999 where the Army agreed that it would do at least an environmental assessment, which is a more limited, more cursory, more modest examination of the potential impacts that is supposed to be purely for the purpose of trying to figure out whether or not there is the potential for a significant impact on the human environment. The notion that doing live fire training at Makua would not have the potential to have significant effects on the human environment just didn't pass the straight face test. You couldn't say it without smiling. By 2000, Hankin says the Army conducted two environmental studies, but a federal judge said the studies were inadequate. After a year-long battle, the courts were expected to rule in favor of Malama Makua. But a national crisis changed everything, and a compromise was struck. A few months later, 9-11 occurred, and as best I can figure, the Pentagon gave the local Army the marching orders that they needed to resolve this legal issue as quickly as possible. They had to stop messing around. And if they needed to do an environmental impact statement, they needed to do an environmental impact statement, but they needed to get back to some limited training. So we entered into a settlement agreement in October of 2001, which in exchange for a very limited set of live fire training during a three-year period, the Army not only agreed to do the full-blown environmental impact statement. It also agreed to guarantee cultural access into Makua Valley, something that the community had demanded for years and the Army had refused. This was a huge win for the Makua community. Access into the valley is now allowed twice a month. That's why I was able to walk the grounds of my ancestors along with dozens of other people. Dr. Fred Dodge, a spokesman from Alama Makua, frequently serves as a guide. Before we start off on the hike, I pull Dr. Dodge aside to have him tell me what a typical day hike is like. We sit under a large, fragrant plumeria tree, blooming with pink-clustered flowers near the base of the valley. 
So when we do these accesses into Makua, we meet in the parking lot, we sign release forms, one for the army that actually says that if you get blown up, it's not their fault. It has no legal bearing, but we sign it. And then uh, usually there's a roster for Malama Makua, and then there may be student rosters like there was today. We have our puli, or prayer, asking the Great Spirit, or Keakua in Hawaiian, to bless our ventures and to protect the valley and to protect us. Uh, we usually cut across the grass to the Ki'i Pohaku, petroglyph rock. This is an ancient upright rock that has Hawaiian stone carvings on it, or petroglyphs. And there are several of ilio, or dogs, and there are several human figures. Uh, ancient ones are usually in the stick figure form, and then if the bodies are filled out, it's more modern. And we have a discussion there. There's also another stone structure, we call it a pohaku, which has depressions in it, which were most likely used to make salt. And the way they did it is they would bring ocean water and fill up these depressions, let it evaporate, and then fill it up again, and pretty soon you have the residue left, which is salt. And it's interesting that the Hawaiian word for salt is pa'akai, or basically standing seawater that's evaporated. I have never met anyone that wasn't completely impressed with Makua. And it's one of the reasons we will take anybody. We've had military up to general rank. We've had police officers. We've had people from other military branches. Professors down to farmers and anybody. We will, we will take anyone here because we feel that the mana and the spirit of the valley is its own best argument for returning the valley. We both sit quietly for a moment, both lost in our own thoughts as little pockets of light find their way through the thick leaves. And for a moment, the valley is pristine again, with running streams that fill terraces of taro patches, and the hills are riddled with ripened sweet potatoes. But that's simply not the case. Having seen what the military has done in their destruction of much of this valley, many of the sites have been injured. Uh, they're taking better care of it now, mostly because the laws have forced them to. You know, those laws came into being in the 80s and 90s, but before then, you could go to places in this valley that just had lots of bullet holes and disrupted the ancient rock walls and so on. It just gave me the impression, just from what they did to this valley, of what militarism and, you know, the U.S. has the largest military. But militarism in general, how it destroys. And it just, to me, doesn't make sense. If I can quote Tony Bennett, Tony Bennett has said that fighting a war is the lowest form of human behavior. It's not intelligent. It's not constructive. It's devastating. This is a quote from Tony Bennett, who, in my opinion, represents middle America. What kind of effects did the military have, not just on the land, but on the natives? To Hawaiians, the land and sea are living ancestors, and we are its children. English teacher Summer Nemeth believes the damage goes beyond the bullet-ridden rocks and the lead-tainted water. There's a cultural and a spiritual harm that no environmental study can measure. The fact that we, we no longer have access to the places of our ancestors, it disconnects us from who we were before and our, our identity, even our identity is corrupted and I think that um, the younger generations have it really hard but, but the generations that were impacted historically, their lives had, had to change from black to white and um, the psychological impacts, you can see that in our kupuna, in our grandparents' generation, in our parents, in our uh, maku, our parents' generation. You can see the impacts, the psychological impacts of 
being surrounded by military your whole life and losing yourself because it just becomes this unwanted part of you that you that you can't shake off. Coming up next. That's contrary to everything we've been told by the military, that Maku is a place that's desolate, it's a desert, there's no water. This place sustained a huge community that was thriving. We believe in our hearts that the military's days are numbered. We really do. And as I've been often reminded, we were outside the gate years ago. Now we're inside. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. You can also download programs or get our podcast at radioproject.org. We now return to Paradise Lost, Military Training in Makua Valley, produced by Making Contact intern Samson Rainey. I'm in the small town of Wainai, right next to Makua Valley. It's a rural area dotted with quaint shops and old plantation homes, left from the days when coffee and sugarcane dominated the economy. I am fortunate enough to join the Makua Makahiki on a practice night. They are a cultural group that honors the valley with traditional chants and hula. Beginning in November during the rise of the Pleiades, or constellation, over the Hawaiian sky, the Makahiki is a time of peace and merriment in the Hawaiian calendar. I watch as they stand with their hands clasped in a circle, their voices soaring high towards the thatched coconut leaf canopy above. Momi Kamahele is Kumu, or head teacher of the group. And we spend the night in Makua. We do our chants, we do our hula to celebrate peace in the valley. We honor our elders, our kupuna, by giving voice to our past. Because I believe by giving voice to our past, we bring all of that good stuff forward. Our chants are now written down, and they provide us with a base for who we are as Hawaiians. What we do is not for public performance. It's really for us, and it's really for Makua. We look at anything that we do for Makua, how is it going to benefit Makua? And I think that that's our group's mindset. So sometimes we hesitate to have recordings or video because I have worked in the travel industry for so long that it just angers me when I have people who call me and they want to video us. I say, no, this is not performance. You know, would you go to the Vatican and video the Pope, you know, doing some sacrifice? mental thing of course not although he's been you know videoed in public doing his speeches okay but that's to me that's really different Mm -hmm. i wouldn't go into your church and go video you while you're receiving sacrament oh that's the mindset of everyone here to protect and honor the valley after all makua means parents and to hawaiians makua is their birthplace legend has it that vakea the sky father and Papa, the Earth Mother, united in the valley and gave birth to the Hawaiian people. Makua is a source of spiritual life, and the destiny of both the valley and the people are intertwined. The destruction of the area means severing that spiritual connection to the land. It seems obvious why the Hawaiian people fight so hard to preserve this sacred ground. Kao Kajihiro, a member of the Makua Makahiki, explains. In the Pele and Hi'iaka epic. One one version has uh, Hi'iaka returning from Kauai 
with Lohi Ao, Pele's lover. They land at Kaina Point. Kyle is telling one of Hawaii's epic stories of Pele and Hi'iaka. Hi'iaka is a goddess of protection who uses the valley to help heal a young girl. And when she arrives at the swimming hole uh, called Kilauea, uh, the people of Makua are there swimming and a beautiful girl dives in the water and she hits a, a, a rock and um, drowns. This rock appeared out of nowhere. So Hi'iaka dives in, rescues the girl and takes her to Makua Beach. And there she chants over the girl's body and breathes ha, the breath of life, back into her body. And she comes back to life. She tells the parents, go up to Makua and in the forest you'll find the plants that will make her well. But I have one other task to do because that stone was not just a rock. It, it was a, an evil a kupua, a spirit that had invaded your swimming hole. And the spirit wanted the girl to love him, but because she rejected him, he killed her. And so I will do battle with this this kupua uh, so that you, you can be free of, of this uh, danger. And so she dives in. There's a great struggle that ensues and this... This uh, foreigner, this invader is cast out uh, and the people celebrate uh, with a huge feast. So it tells us a number of things. It tells us that Maku is a place of healing. Uh, this miraculous uh, re re restoration of life happens there. It tells us uh, ethnobotanical knowledge about the forest and, and the medicines that it contains. Uh, it tells us about the richness of Maku Valley where people could on an on a instant uh, create a luau, a festival, in, you know, to welcome and honor this um, Hi'iaka and her feats of uh, saving the valley. Uh, and and it, that's contrary to everything we've been told by the military, that Maku is a place that's desolate, it's a desert, there's no water. This place sustained a huge community that was thriving. And that's the vision I think that people have, Maku as a place of life-giving force where people can, can relearn some of that, that wisdom that has been lost and taken away from the community. In the last few years since 9-11, the military has attempted its largest land grab in Hawaii since World War II, seeking to acquire an additional 25,000 acres for bases and training. The military now controls nearly a quarter of the island of Oahu, all in the name of defending national security. It's one of the arguments the Army has made to continue training in Makua. Between October 2001 to October 2004, the U.S. military used Makua Valley for 26 live fire exercises, even though a total of 37 were allowed. If the Army needed the valley for national security, why didn't it utilize all of the allowable training exercises? It's a question not lost on Earth Justice lawyer David Henkin. So when the Army comes out to the public and says, we must train at Makua. This recent history shows that the facts simply don't back up their rhetoric. If you look at the facts, uh, the Army has repeatedly demonstrated that it can adequately prepare soldiers without training at Makua. And that lesson is reinforced by what has happened since October of 2004, because under the 2001 agreement, if the Army did not finish the environmental impact statement in three years, it was prohibited from doing any live fire training at Makua until that environmental impact statement was done. And as I sit here today in October of 2007, that environmental impact statement is still not done. So there has not been a shot fired at Makua since the summer of 2004. The sound of gunfire might have ceased for now, but the military has still not given up its stake on the land. We tried to interview the U.S. Army to get their side of the story, but they declined to comment. So for now, the stalemate continues. During this reprieve, some see hope, like Momi Kamahele, the Makua Makahiki teacher. Essentially, it's we believe in our hearts that the military's days are numbered. We really do. And as I've been often reminded, by members of the group, we were outside the gate years ago. Now we're inside, okay? We want to stay inside. And what that means is the military will have to leave. That's all there is to it. Some even hope for more, like Malama Makua spokesman, Dr. Dodge. We speak of the University of Makua, which is what our plans are for the future. We would like to become experts in clearing out unexploded ordinances, which we call UXO, to reforest, to bring back the waters, because reforestation will do that, 
to have a place of spiritual renewal and meditation, to have a place where Hawaiians and people who are Hawaiian at heart can practice the Hawaiian culture and spirit. And that is what our ultimate goal is. It's a clear day in Makua, and the birds are playfully chirping among the trees. People say you can hear them now that the guns and bombs have temporarily ceased. If that will last, only time will tell. But for now, as the standoff continues between the U.S. military and Malama Makua, the Hawaiian people take solace in the quietude as the valley slowly regains its spirit and grace. I really hope that for those those people who who do end up coming to Hawaii, make their take the the trek to Makua, just to bathe in the shade, you know, the shadow of the of the mountain, just to to appreciate what what it has to offer, and then to realize that if enough people say clean up and go, that maybe someday. Our grandchildren will be running around this place and, and will be living like my ancestors were. For Making Contact, I'm Samson Rainey, Makua Oahu, Hawaii. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. This program was produced by Samson Rainey as part of the National Radio Project's internship program. Special thanks to Dan Turner, Ron Rucker, and the Monday Morning Breakfast crew. Our theme music is by the Charlie Hunter Trio. For a CD copy of program number 0408, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736, or you can get our podcast at radioproject.org. Lisa Rudman is our executive director, Andrew Stelser, producer, Puck Lowe, associate producer, Samson Rainey and Elena Botkin-Levy, interns, and I'm Tina Rubio. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. There's a sweater of mine I've had for many years. It's faded, it has a hole in the left armpit. Oh, okay, there's one in the right one too. And when my mom sees me wearing this sweater, she gets this face. I'm making the face now, you can't see it, but she gets this face and she shakes her head and then she goes straight to the mall to purchase me another sweater, 3XL. But I still take my old worn sweater to the dry cleaners every two weeks. Why? Because it's familiar, because it's comfortable, because it's dependable, because it's a perfect fit. KPFA's Winter Fun Drive begins on February 6th, and we hope you will support us. Sure, uh, there's no holes in our armpits, but we do have leaks. And when friends see your KPFA sticker on your hybrid car, they shake their heads and ask why. Well, you just tell them you do it because KPFA is familiar. KPFA is comfortable.